Never wanted it. We'll go live with the end. Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the IQ Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Uh, ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU journal, which offers complete coverage of communications and networking paradigms free of charge for readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this new webinar series will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today the webinar on information and communication theory with biochemical and molecular components for biological sensing and control with Professor Massimiliano Pierbon from the Molecular and Biochemical Telecommunications Lab from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. Uh, please submit your questions via the Q&A channel. We will address them to our speaker during the Q&A session. And after the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something very special for you. The Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. Uh, Professor Piero Bon agreed to a very personal chat. Uh, he will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator of today's webinar, Professor Iana Kilditz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and Founder and President of Truva from the United States. Uh, I'm sure most of you know already Professor Kilditz. Um, Ken Bias, Chair of Professors in Telecommunications Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. In the last two decades, he has established many research centers around, around the world, including in South Africa, Spain, Saudi Arabia, and Finland. He's Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals and visiting distinguished professor uh, in several universities around the world. Professor Akildiz is highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings. Uh, so, Professor Kilditz, the floor is yours for your opening remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Alessandria, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening all around the world. I again welcome you to our ITU International Telecommunication Union Journal for Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. I have the great pleasure to introduce you one of the gifted researchers of his generation, Dr. Massimiliano Pirabon, as our distinguished speaker today. Before I present his career, I, wouldn't, I would like to share my personal experience with Massimo. I met him in person, it's like yesterday, for the first time at Politecnico di Milano, Italy, uh, when I was visiting uh, that time. In, in fact, it was like September, October 2007. And I was giving a seminar on nanoscale communications, in particular molecular communications. After my talk, 
Massimo asked, I call him Massimo as a shorter form. Massimo asked many interesting questions and I liked him. And he was very curious and very interested. We continued our discussions afterwards. He really occupied himself in the, some, quite some time. We kept in touch and he came to my lab as a visiting researchers, researcher at Georgia Tech in 2008. And then he liked everything, uh, not only me, but also Georgia Tech and all the city, et cetera, and his friends. He decided to stay to do his PhD with me on molecular communication. And I can say that uh, he's one of my top PhD students that I graduated in my career, uh, almost 50. And also it was uh, immense and great pleasure working with Massimo, uh, a very creative uh, person, uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, he was also a key person for our Monaco uh, uh, molecular and nanoscale communications multidisciplinary project. We had like almost 20, 30 people with uh, professors from biology, mechanical engineering, truly multidisciplinary project. It was supported by NSF from 2012 to 2016. He did really pioneering work on molecular communications. His papers are not only pioneering work, but also received hundreds of citations. Due to Google Scholar, his H index is 25 and number of citations is 36, uh, 3961. Uh, 3,961. And I can also point that out. Uh, Massimo is a unique researcher. He is really for quality, not quantity. Uh, that's why he can, you can see that uh, he's not writing tons of papers, but he writes uh, specific papers and receives uh, 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 many citations and also uh, conducts uh, impactful research. And uh, he graduated in 2013 and uh, joined the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where he is an associate professor with School of Computing with joint appointment with Department of Biochemistry at that university. He received many awards from IEEE, also uh, from University of Nebraska and uh, some companies and other agencies. His research is on the crossroads of fundamentals of mathematics, algorithms, statistics, information, and communication sciences, and uh, with the focus on molecular communications. Uh, we thank you on behalf of ITU, uh, Massimo, for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Achilles, for this very flattering presentation. I, I hope to live up to the expectations. And with that, I'll start sharing my screen. And okay, perfect. So I guess you can all see my screen now. And uh, we can start. So first of all, welcome to this webinar. Uh, and uh, thank you, Professor Achilles. Thank you, Alessia. Thank you, ITU, for your invitation. Uh, today, um, I will talk about information theory uh, with a slightly different twist than probably the one you are used to, uh, which is the molecular, biochemical, but more importantly, the life twist. Um, and so uh, because I want to have this twist today, I will slice my research in a very particular way. This is probably the first time I slice my research in this way. So it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. So let's start for in, from introducing, introducing molecular communication. So molecular communication <clears throat> starts indeed with molecules and information. So if you consider the reality around us, the whole reality is built of mixture of substances. Uh, each substance is a form of matter with specific homogeneous chemical composition and properties. And uh, once you isolate one certain substance, that substance is form of identical molecules. So the molecule is the smallest identifiable unit of a substance. And so the molecule retains the information that that substance has in the reality there is around us, which is indeed the molecular composition and structure, but also the way the molecule reacts with other molecules. 
And that is the real basis of the information we talk about when we talk about molecular communication. So this information is embedded, as we said, in one single molecule of, the, of a substance, replicated to all the molecule of the substance that form then the mixture of substances that we look at all around us. The molecule is formed uh, of atoms and the atoms are together through strong forces and chemical bonds. And so the information that the molecule carries can only be changed when we change the structure of the molecule, when there is a change in these bonds. And this change is operated by the chemical reactions. A chemical reaction rearranges when it happens, the molecule composition and structure in very different ways, depending on the reaction. It's indeed the primary engine that is pumping uh, and it's consuming energy and it's creating processes where information flows in molecular communication. It can be contained in nanoscale because the molecules and the bonds that is the primary structure of the matter is indeed nanoscale dimension. And that's why we call molecular communication a true nano communication paradigm. What are then the elements of molecular communication theory? So we talked about the molecules, we talked about the chemical reactions, and the third element that I didn't talk about is the mobilization of molecules, also called molecule transport. So molecules indeed, uh, depending on where they are and which substance it is, they can be moved in many different ways. And their movement, as you can imagine, transports their structure, therefore transports information. So if we put all of this together and we, we really look at, look at it under the lens of communication theory, we can identify a true process where I have the transmission, a channel and, the, and a receiver where information flows and, and finally a destination. And, and this whole process can be replicated into a molecular communication network. And so this is a molecular communication, what we call a molecular communication link. So what are basic molecular communication systems that we can think of. Well, molecules propagate through free diffusion naturally. If you think about a gas, you just release a gas and that will propagate to Brownian motion through the space. When molecules are released, they propagate and because they propagate, they can reach a certain distance. If they reach a distance, with the information that they contain, the structure of the molecule, they are also propagating information. And this is one of the most basic and fundamental processes that transport information in nature. And so molecular communication indeed starts from observing how natural, in natural environments, uh, biological organisms communicate with each other. And, and it's a true biological channel uh, that is living inside us uh, that uh, communicate information at a distance in the space. For example, two elephants communicate uh, information on the mat matting cycles uh, through pheromones. And the pheromones travel from one elephant to the other. And so if we look at it from a communication perspective, uh, this can be modeled. As, as a process actually can be modeled as a channel. And that's the inception, the inception of the diffusion-based molecular communication channel. Let's go to a more complex molecular communication, the human body. Uh, think about, for example, the hormonal system. Uh, our hypothalamus in the brain releases hormones, they go into the bloodstream and they transport information to different parts of the body. For example, some hormones transport information to the heart and they tell the heart to pump faster or slower. Um, and other, uh, other uh, means of information that can be thought of that are somewhat less natural and more artificial are what happens when we inject drug in a human body. And in fact, from this thought, 
uh, we we had this extremely interesting project that was um, um, uh, funded by Samsung SAIT, uh, where we were studying the molecular communication inside the body where the signal is actually the structure of the drug molecule. And the reception is the healing process at the organ that, that needed to receive the drug. Again, this is a molecular communication channel fairly more complicated than the diffusion-based, but still can be studied under the lenses of, a communi of communication theory. Some examples of applica application, biological hazard networks. Uh, you can think of having a network of communication among biological devices, for example, programmable, I'll talk about that more later. Or you can think about using the communication within the bloodstream to better provide the drug around the body. For example, focus better methods of injection of the drug. Or we can use this as a method to augment the functionalities of the human body. Uh, think about being able to interact with, for example, our gut and being able to sense the state and also interact with the functionality. So this opens up a truly holistic vision of molecular communication, especially for human health. When we can see system organ and tissue uh, as, as a molecular communication system, but also going down to the molecular, to the cellular and molecular processes until the DNA as one fundamental unit that carries information inside the body and also uh, stores information. Through synthetic biology, I can also think about re-engineering this system and creating devices that can embed functionalities in the biochemical environment until embracing a true biocyber uh, system that is comprised of our body and devices that can sense and actuate functionalities in the biological environment itself. But before going more into those kinds of applications, we have to understand how information is flowing in a biological system. So, Biological organisms have evolved to manipulate information in biological environments. We know that information is stored in DNA genes. Uh, DNA genes can be parsed, they have a functionality, they have control statement, pretty much like computer programs. Information flows through the, uh, from the DNA gene transcription and translation through uh, a structure that is composed of little bricks, which are called amino acid that then uh, because of their um, relationship with each other, they actually interact and form a three-dimensional three structure that has a precise function. So information for function here is extreme, an extremely important concept. And then information not only is inside a cell, but information is also exchanged between cells. And so one cell can tell another cell, grow more, grow better. I get a cut on my finger. Around the finger, the cells are told to grow, to divide uh, uh, faster than the other cells of the body to actually heal my cut. And, um, and so all this brings us to think about what happens uh, when um, I look at the, 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 the biological systems uh, either inside the single cell, which is the fundamental unit of life, or also among cells? Uh, and and, and if, one, if we can think about that as a, as a true information flow, we can see how information can guide processes, biological processes, so important like cell differentiation in tissue, coordination in bacterial infection, and even the whole homeostasis of our human body. Um, from the very beginning, uh, well, from, from a certain point of, uh, of, uh, of my work, what I was interested in is studying how a cell indeed absorbs information from the environment and whether this is possible to be interpreted as a communication channel or actually a series of many communication channels and whether then it is possible to re-engineer this channel for very different purposes. If you, uh, and if you think about the biomedical, that's actually the very first aim of this research. And so uh, imagine that a cell 
uh, wherever it is, I don't know, a unicellular or in a tissue, is constantly bombarded with information from the outside environment. Signaling molecules um, that, uh, for example, hormones, metabolites like nutrients, environmental stressors, it's, it's too hot, it's too cold. The, all those information uh, are propagated through biomolecular mechanism through the, to the cell uh, DNA, where the cell indeed uh, processes this information and takes action and takes decision. The decision can be uh, adjust the rate of growth. Uh, the decision can be die, so apoptosis, to maintain the rest of the population healthy, or also to produce, to have other subproducts, for example, proteins uh, that interact with the external environment. But if this channel get interrupted, these functionalities cannot take place. So these channels have been studied, have been evolved through the millennia to actually uh, of, um, enable information flow for very precise functions. And so what we look at, what we can look at here is the main uh, networks. Uh, each one is a, a sort of homogeneous network in terms of components that propagate this external information inside the cellular environment. So the first is the signal transduction that takes signal from outside and propagates to the DNA. The second is uh, the gene expression where the DNA processes information and takes action. And the third one is the metabolic network where the cell indeed processes most of this information and transform knowledge into energy and energy into growing and dividing and perpetuating the species. So one of the first uh, works that, that we did was to study uh, these channels from signal transaction to gene regulation. We produce uh, a couple of publications uh, on that. And then we studied the channels between gene regulation and metabolism. Now, I cannot obviously go through all these results, but I just want to give you an all overall idea of what it means to study this channel from the communication perspective. Let's take uh, a signal transduction network. These are molecular processes that convey information from extracellular signals, for example, growth hormone to inside the cell to processes that are called uh, phosphorylation. There is a very um, intricate network of chemical reactions inside the cell that is connected also to the processing unit, which is the DNA. And at the end, the cell, thanks to this information flow, can adjust and fine tune many different functionalities. Now, if I, if I can model this in a more schematic way, uh, I, I know that there is some input information. I know that there are communication channel inside the cell. And then there is some output information that results in the fine tuning of those functional functionality. If there are disruptions, if I have information loss, and mainly they are due to mutation in the pathway genes that practically disrupt the functionality of some of these hubs. These are actually network hubs, uh, are actually chemical reactions. But if these chemical reactions do not take place properly, there is a problem. And many of these problems are at the basis of actually cancer. And so that's why we actually study in one of those, well, our work, um, uh, we study kidney cancer. And so we wanted to verify upon kidney cancer, uh, what is the information loss and where it happens within those networking hubs. And we actually found that most of the information loss happens at the receptor, uh, and at this hub, there is one of the molecules uh, that, uh, that happens to distribute information because it's very reactive and so it reacts with many other molecules. That's why it's a hub. And, 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 and this is what creates the disruption in the cancer and, and creates cancer ultimately. So what we can observe here is that we have a novel approach to estimate the information flow through a single cell. We, we uh, came up with novel metrics, or if, if you want, we imported them from communication to classify biological system. And we can use them for many different 
reasons for many different applications, fine control of production of biological components, novel ways to classify organism and pathologies, and uh, also ways to reduce web experiments to look for the best experiments with the highest probability of success, and also novel strategies for, for healthcare. So we, we were then, uh, um, we, we had the opportunity uh, because of our work in information theory applied to biology to propose to the National Science Foundation the organization of a workshop that took place just before the pandemic in January 2020. So we were in person, which is amazing to think about right now. Um, and in this uh, specific workshop, we invited all the experts in the world that were working at the intersection between biology information communication and coding theory. And we built a community, a community that was not there before, uh, a community of people who can now exchange information and work together and collaborate. That's thanks to, thanks to the funding of NSF, NSF and thanks to uh, also my, my co-organizer, Ivan Ariel from University of Maryland. So out of that, a lot of new collaboration started. Uh, and some of them are actually with my uh, own group. In one collaboration, we started to look at information and life, which is not something that we saw with the single cell before. So think about having two substances in the environment. For example, these two substances characterized by this molecular structure. They carry information, right? The molecular structure, so the chemical composition, but also the time when they are in the environment, the location where they are in the environment. So if I look at what happens to two cells that are in this environment, uh, if these two cells use this substance for life, so they need them for living and they need to know where they are and when they are. If the cells have too little information, and let's imagine one thing, that this information is costly. So every time I acquire one bit of information about it, I actually spend part of my energy. So if I want to conserve energy, I end up having too little information. So one cell uh, in this case dies and the other can replicate, survive, or perpetuate the species. So some individual did not know enough. Too much information cost means that one cell can die, but one cell will die because all the energy will be spent to acquire information and another cell might replicate. But again, it's not an ideal situation. Some individuals spend all resources to know too much. The just right information means the trade-off between uh, information cost and survival is what actually evolution uh, has given to the um, uh, living organisms. And so minimal resources spent to know enough information to survive. So it's quite different from the devices we are used to where, for example, in the internet, we want to be as fast as possible. With our cell phone, we want to be as fast as possible. Here, no, here we want to be fast enough. And so that's why there is a lot of discussion in the mathematical biology literature about reward fitness, that is survival versus information cost. So sensing and processes is a trade-off found by evolution. And uh, there have been proposed some quantities to measure that. So one is the fitness value of information on the goal Kelly information, the increase in fitness resulting from an amount of information. So I don't just classify a cell from how much information does it get, but is from how much of that information is actually good for the cell to survive. The second is, uh, a very nice concept for me that is the semantic information. When do we talk about semantic information in information theory? Never, because Shannon, just at the beginning of his seminal paper, said uh, a telecommunication uh, um, uh, a designer or a, or a communication engineer does not care about semantics. We just want to transmit something from point A to point B. We don't care what is in the message. But here, we, the cell actually care what is the most important message is the one that ensures survival. And so the semantic information is defined. This is a definition that is, that, are, that is in the literature is a minimum information to ensure organism maximum viability, which is fitness. So from there, we started to study. And uh, 
we started to understand that many of this work uh, were pointing at uh, an underlying rule of life where more information is always better if it does not cost more. So a little bit closer to, let's say, our cell phone that have to save battery, but at the same time, they have to be fast. Well, does nature always optimize a communication channel given constraint on the cost of information? Well, the problem is that if nature were doing that, every individual in a certain species in the same environmental condition will end up having the same communication channel rate or the same performance, the same amount of information flow. And that's not what we observe. Just like us human, we have a diversity of sensing and perception in many situations. So, and, and bacteria as well. And so what's, what's the driving force of that? Uh, well, first of all, we started to shift the constraint from information cost to the capability of an organism to manipulate the information channel. So we let not only one, uh, one type of optimization take play, taking place, but we let each organism at, at the, inside a certain population, we let them manipulate their channel to be more effective. And we ended up with something that is interesting. Uh, uh, we ended up building a computational model uh, as a counterexample to the previous literature. And so this computational model starts uh, imagining a motile species, so a cell that is moving in a one dimensional environment. Uh, it can leave off two nutrients, A and B, let's say bread and butter, okay. Uh, and absorbs A and B uh, uh, proportionally to the concentration they are where the cell is at a certain moment in this 1D line. The cell can divide and so perpetuate the species only when both store A and B are over a threshold. So they, they are, these quantities also identify how much the cell is growing. And when they are over a threshold, they divide. Uh, the cell senses A and B gradients through uh, chemical receptors. And so here we introduce the binomial noise that is omnipresent in chemoreceptor, chemoreception in biology and, and in biological channels. And finally, uh, it moves uh, the cell proportionally to the steeper gradient. So the cell, because of the receptor, can estimate the gradient in the concentration of A and B and chooses the steeper gradient to move in one direction or another. And finally, it constantly consumes stored A and B. If A and B, for any reason, A or B get to zero, the cell dies. It cannot sustain itself anymore. We devise two possible strategies. In the first strategy, the cell keeps all the receptors constant at a constant level. In the second strategy, the cell can adapt its receptors uh, by following a rule. <clears throat> the rule is that I, I, I put out in my, on my outside more receptors. So I reserve more channels for the quantity A or B I have less. So the lesser quantity drives more uh, sensing. So I'm more concerned about the quantity that is depleting. So doing that, uh, we set up a simulation. We, we, we read the result using two performance metrics. One is information efficiency, which is nothing but the average mutual information of this channel overall in all the population, uh, where uh, we, 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 we can parse this mutual information as the mutual information of a certain concentration uh, and the corresponding receptor for that kind of concentration, either A or B for that kind of substance. And then the second is the growth rate. We looked at the exponential growth or doubling rate, which is a normal parameter in, in biology and in evolutionary theory, uh, but we had to discretize it. And so we define a simulation step, delta T, and we define a simulation time. And we accounted for the number of cell population at only sample size time. And we look at the rate, how fast 
are the cells growing? So this is just a couple of run of this simulation and they are very interesting. So first of all, I want to focus your attention on how we displaced A and B molecules in the environment. This is a 1D uh, environment and these molecules of A and these are molecules of B and we displace them in a way that they are distributed according to a distribution called von Mises. So this environment is actually a loop. So the, the 100 goes back to zero. It's, uh, it's looped inside itself. And the von Mises distribution is the distribution with the maximum entropy on a periodic support. So what we did is simulate, here we simulated actually a couple of, of, of cells uh, and we have the, these two trajectory here for the equal receptor allocation and here for the adaptive. I just want you to notice that the equal receptor allocation uh, has a cell density, this one in, in this uh, kind of yellowish color, that is much more uniform and so not well adaptive to instead the cell density of the adaptive that follows a little bit the, the, the uh, ridges uh, and the spikes of the von Mises distribution for the two. But the main result is the following. So uh, uh, we define a certain cell stress, uh, which is the rate of consumption of A and B, and we vary this cell stress, which is how difficult, how hard for the cell it is to live indeed. Uh, and we found out that for all the values of the cell stress that we considered, uh, the adaptive receptor strategy was having a, a lower information rate of each channel. So it was actually getting less information from the environment uh, as compared to the equal receptor, but the, the adaptive receptor strategy was more fitted. So, so the cells having adaptive receptor strategy were showing a higher growth rate with, with respect to the equal. So less information, higher growth rate. How did this happen? Well. Uh, it happens because the, the cells differentiated the channels and that's what we call subjective information. This is nothing but the variance of the average mutual, so it's the variance, sorry, it's the variance of the mutual information uh, of the cells at different cell stresses. And these variance are of course is zero for the adapt, for the equal receptor allocation because they don't change their channel. But instead for the adaptive, it changes with respect to the stress and with respect to the noise. This is a noise factor connected to the binomial distribution I told you before. And so this objective information we believe is the first time in the literature that has been kind of uh, demonstrated with a, with a, with a toy model. Uh, and, uh, and we are moving from there uh, with, with this to understand better how information flows in biological organisms. So what did we learn? Maximizing information efficiency can result in a lower growth rate. And so evolution can enable a diversity of perception. This is the genesis of why we are perceiving different things differently or the same things differently. Uh, so this is a new dim dimension to understand uh, living organisms and they, their relationship to information is a novel inspired approach to design communication system and is a push to revise information theory to address the life component. So we talk about understanding. Now let's talk about engineering. So what I want to do is characterize model and design systems based on living communicating devices to control the propagation of information in biological environment. And this was nothing but the statement of, uh, of my proposal that I got funded a couple of years ago that is called uh, wet, WETCOM of Fundamentals of Wet Communication Theory, uh, where indeed we look at how to take those channels we talked about before and engineer them uh, with a very, very uh, highly tuned uh, engineering uh, process. And so, um, and as you see here, there, there, there is also a lab component to that. And so we are actually, we approach uh, bio collaborators in biology to carry out this type of project. So cells naturally exchange information through molecules, as I, as I said, uh, and the idea was to apply communication theory. Uh, there has been prior literature where this type of um, 
in engineer systems, in biological systems, have been studied in, uh, in, in communication engineering. But uh, uh, what we did uh, was go a little bit beyond that and trying to first estimate what is the maximum information rate that uh, two engineer cells can exchange if they are engineered to transmit information using molecules that diffuse between one cell and the other. And the other um, uh, topic we were interested in is how to engineer uh, or re-engineer this structure to include coding. So uh, source coding, but more, more importantly, channel coding. And so we, we started to think about coding, but the problem is we had to remove algorith algorithms, electronics, and we had to apply coding processes and coding structure and coding programs to genetic circuits, which is a whole other uh, uh, Pandora, Pandora's box that I opened in the, in the past years. So I just wanted to give you an idea, a very quick idea of one of the latest results that we had. So um, the, the idea of engineering cells to exchange information is really not new. Through synthetic biology, this has been demonstrated to be successful. Um, and so the, the idea though now uh, is that, uh, can we forward engineer this? So it's not just a proof of concept. We actually want to optimize this system like we optimize an optical fiber to transmit as, mu as much information as possible. Uh, compatible of course with all the things that we learned before. Um, and so we, we look at, we look at prototypical system when I have two cells that are stimulated uh, biochemically and they exchange information uh, through diffusion. And inside the cell, of course, I have a bunch of chemical reactions. So, and the main idea was uh, if I have a source signal and a destination signal, what's the communication performance, the mutual information and what's the maximum of it? So how much information is delivered in bit per message or in bit per channel use, if you want. And so we studied then a very specific uh, system from synthetic biology for which we have actually physical parameters uh, to, to, to uh, study. Uh, and this is composed of, of an engineering structure with biological circuits. And so um, what we did is we built a model in MATLAB in biology that takes into account not only of the chemical reaction, but also the noise that is between chemical reaction, uh, which is derived from that binomial, uh, binomial, binomial distribution that I told you before. And then in this case, it actually becomes uh, a, 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 uh, a nested uh, Poisson process. And so we, this is, these are all the equations that, that we input into MATLAB. These are all the parameters that we got into literature. Of course, they are not in only one paper. We had to just uh, you know, comb uh, a lot of literature from synthetic biology. But finally, we found out a model for which we could actually represent the output uh, distribution of probability density function given a certain input, in this case, a uniform distribution input. And so again, from, from here, we have our distribution and, and we have, uh, we have uh, uh, for example, here we, we say, uh, we, we look at an av average, the mean and the variance. I mean, you can observe that this channel has only a linear component here, but the rest has saturation. And so this channel is really not very an amenable to um, analytical study. It's not an AWGN channel at all, unfortunately. And so the main idea is, can we build a structure, um, an algorithmic structure that with an, uh, with an unknown statistical model can actually build uh, a um, expression or can actually find numerically an achievable information rate. And so there are solutions out there uh, that are ad hoc for that. And one is the Blauta Remoto, very, very famous. The problem is the analytical expression of the conditional entropy, either the channel or the equivocation have to be known or estimated. And, and then there is our iterative method that we are presenting here. The comparison that we made is with another methodology uh, that, has, uh, that has been presented not long ago, where instead they were estimating this distribution with the Blauta remoto. So what we did is we used 
uh, we, we, we actually devised a structure or, or an algorithm that is based, based on an elder mid optimization um, algorithm. And so in this structure, practically, we iteratively modify the input distribution according to parameter. And we do a search on the parameters of the input distribution. In, in fact, we use the person family of distribution that has four moments. And so we actually um, uh, varied each one of the moments and the combinations. But of course, the search for all the combination is intractable. And so what we use to simplify that is the Nelder mid, which is an optimization process where you build simplexes. So you build a series of points in the distribution where you can, uh, um, uh, and each of those points correspond to a certain mutual information that can be uh, numerically uh, estimated from the simulation. And then uh, this structure is actually, is very similar to the gradient descent, but it's multidimensional. And so it actually moves along the steeper, the steepest gradient or the steeper gradient until going to the optimum. It is that in this case, our optimum was the, uh, the, the highest mutual information. And so the achievable information rate. Compared to the SLAMI for an AWGN channel, so without knowing that it's at the AWGN, you apply that, and you can also use the McCallips lower bound and upper bound as a comparison. Our methodology works pretty much like the SLAMI at lower SNR, but for higher SNR, the SLAMI starts to diverge from the upper bound, so it's higher than the upper bound. And our methodology goes sometimes a little bit lower than the lower bound, but still it's pretty consistent. And so going to our data, our biological data, we found out that uh, um, if you see here, the, the optimal mutual information, this is the one that we would uh, estimate with the SLAMI. This is indeed uh, what we estimated uh, a different iteration of our algorithm. You see that at a certain point they get quite stable. And so we are in the ballpark of this number. We also uh, tried to see the mutual information with a triangular input distribution and a Gaussian. But what, what is the best input distribution indeed uh, for this kind of system, engineer system? It is actually uh, um, something like this, this blue one that you see. And so it's, it has a spike at, uh, at uh, uh, lower input power and, uh, and uh, uh, another spike at higher input power. And so the, this lets us know that the viability of information transfer optimization um, can be increased if I design properly the distribution of the input message. And I have an iterative algorithm to, to estimate it. Can we apply coding theory to enhance this performance? The answer is yes, but we need to study uh, um, synthetic biology to understand how to program uh, bi biochemical processes to actually do the coding. And so all this body of work was devoted to that. Uh, I will not go too much uh, into detail now, just in the interest of time. So what did you learn? Uh, what did we learn for this? So we presented a computational method to estimate information exchange of self-cell communication. Is feasible um, uh, to apply information theory-based concept to synthetic biology. And we presented a proof of concept design methodology. And that is, although in the papers that I, I didn't show now, but they are for you for reference to see, to actually enhance this performance and move one step forward uh, till the achievable information rate that we found uh, with the, in the results that I just presented. So biological circuits seem extremely versatile to design communication structures. So now very quickly, just uh, a round down uh, of the concept of uh, internet of bio nano things. Imagine uh, the human body and imagine to have devices in the human body that can be inherently biological like artificial organ, artificial gut microbes that are designed uh, through synthetic biology but also electrical devices like we have now, for example, implantable devices uh, like, like a smartwatch, which is not implantable of course, but, uh, but an insulin pump, for example, a, a gas stimulator, a peacemaker and so on. So uh, our vision in the, in the internet bio nano things is to be able to gather information and in, in connect this information to the internet. 
And if this is not scary enough, we also uh, would like to control these processes through the internet. The real problem uh, is that we study a little bit of everything, but now the, one of the focuses is how do I realize the interface between the biological and the electrical domain? And so the main idea that was actually comes from my collaborator in the University of Maryland College Park is to build a device that is based on the chemical reactions that in biology exchange electrons between molecules and can also exchange electrons with an electron. So an electrical interface. And so what we started, and then of course, um, it was coronated by, by uh, NSF, uh, a big NSF grant that uh, started a couple of years ago as well, uh, is to study this system and to study how to make an integrated device that uses many of the system to build biomedical devices that interact with the human body. Think about here having, for example, a tissue. And on the other side, you have just a tree of electrodes that you can connect or connectors that you can connect to your electrical devices. So this comprises the study of communication, memory, and computation. So what we did is, first of all, study this interface. And so we opened up the interface and studied that as a communication channel. And so these are the classical, uh, classical uh, boxes of communication from source to destination. And the interesting fact is that um, this, this is the whole interface. And the whole interface is able to read differences in concentration of certain kind of molecules, which are redox active, so they can exchange electrons, which are omnipresent in biology, by the way. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and it uses, it takes this molecule inside and then circulate these molecules with other molecules uh, that are embedded in the, in the device to then read these differences concentration uh, in, the, in, in the output. So this is a fairly complicated model, um, but what we did is we realized this model in, and it's really not, uh, we, we express it analytically, but it's, uh, as you can imagine, not very tractable. Um, and uh, and uh, we, uh, we realized a um, simulation in Simulink. And just to give you an idea, this is the experimental device that we used to get results uh, and, and uh, um, uh, validate our simulation. So uh, this is an electrode, um, and this is a solution containing redox active molecule. Uh, and then we can vary with a pipette their concentration and study how the signal changes. And so we use ferrocene in our experiments, uh, and we use some parameters. These are just parameters taken from biochemistry, uh, from electrochemistry literature. And so these are some of our simulation results, or at least just one simulation result. And then we identified also things that are missing in our simulation to be really, really effective. And then this is the simulation using different signals, actually different amplitudes of our signal. Uh, but of course, your question might be, uh, what's the mutual information? What's the performance of such a, such a device? So the device that our collaborators have uh, for which we use the parameters, physical and chemical parameters, showed in our simulation-based scenario, an estimated mutual information of almost one bit. So it's pretty slow uh, per channel used. Um, when the, but when the concentration that I want to read of that biological molecules is one femtomolar to 1.9 femtomolar. So very little concentration. And this is the, these are the concentration at which we can actually extract information from a cell or from a population of cell, from a tissue. And so this is just an idea of um, the different uh, output distribution when I have uh, input that is um, uniform. So to conclude, uh, I want to take a stand to uh, thank, but also invite everybody to have an IGEN team in your institution. If, I, if you are in higher education or even if you are in high school, um, having an IGEN team is just great, uh, especially for somebody like me who started not knowing anything about synthetic biology. An IGEN team enables you to work with undergraduate students to actually build 
uh, during summer months, uh, a artifact of, uh, of, uh, of a genetically engineered organism, usually it's a bacterium or, or yeast, to actually participate to a competition in Boston that is every year. So we had multiple years running iGEM and it was just a blast. And some of my students that are working, who are working now in my lab and, and, and produce some of the results that you saw today, uh, and I have to thank them too, of course, uh, they are actually started being in my iGEM team and being then uh, get the passion for this type of research. And they are computer engineering students. And so we, we got multiple awards through the years and a lot of visibility because uh, don't forget Nebraska didn't have an iGEM team before. And so uh, while there are 300 plus iGEM team all around the world, especially on the West and East Coast and especially, especially in Europe. And so many, many things. Uh, so we are running Nanocom 2022. I'm one of the co-general chairs. It will be in a beautiful city, Barcelona. Uh, and uh, please uh, look at our website. Uh, there are all the deadlines and uh, the submission. <laughs> the submission links uh, to it through EDAS. Uh, please consider submitting a contribution if you're working on nanoscale computing or communication, not only molecular communication, but also at large, any nanoscale uh, nano biosystem or nanosystem. Uh, we also are running, um, and I'm a co-editor in chief for nano communication networks. And I have to say that both ACM Nanocom and Nano Communication Network was funded by Professor Achildes, who is here, uh, with us. So he started this discipline and he started this movement that now it's kind of exploded. Uh, and it's out there in all the major conferences. Uh, I just, for example, chaired uh, 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 a special track, uh, 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 sorry, uh, track in a symposium in ICC uh, on, on molecular communication. I just chair uh, or I'll be chairing another conference uh, pretty soon. And so these are all my collaborators and students and whatnot who worked with me to produce these results. And uh, without them, uh, my results wouldn't look good. So I have, and, and without them, I couldn't even be here. And without some of them, I couldn't even start this kind of career. And um, we know who you're talking about, of course. And so, um, uh, thank you, thank you to all of you, and thank you to all the funding that I received through the year, and I continuously receive. Uh, just the light, latest one is 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 from Defense, actually. Um, and uh, but although uh, Defense work is not here, uh, that's uh, probably for another time. Um, and so, thank you for your attention. It's been a blast to be with you today, um, and I'm open to any question, and I'm so happy to chat with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Massimo. Well, I knew that uh, it would be excellent, and it, it was indeed excellent and clear, and uh, I'm really proud of you. And uh, I'm also thank happy you. that uh, you have a lot of activities, really, bravo. So there are many questions here and before I ask my questions I have to be fair to the others so let me start with uh, you know I don't know bottom up or top down uh, Lokendra Shuhan is asking could you please discuss about the simulation methods I mean this is too long question but I will I suggest that you know you mention about what simulation tool you use or something right Yes, I'm of not course. Here so, to explain all the <laughs> simulation. Methods. No, no, but it, it's pretty simple just to introduce them. So the the, the main simulation I started from uh, is indeed MATLAB Sim Biology. It's a relatively new package in the MATLAB distribution. So if you are in a uh, higher education institution, usually you should have it. Um, and uh, and so um, that contains the major processes uh, in chemistry and biochemistry that you need to actually set up your simulation in a very, very, you know, simplified settings, of course. Um, the other simulator that I used uh, and I mentioned is Simulink. So for Simulink, we actually designed, uh, well, actually we used Simulink in conjunction with, uh, uh, with Symbiology and Simulink is another MATLAB add-on 
uh, of course. Um, and Simulink is, has very good uh, modules to design electronics. And so when we wanted to, do, to, to model the interface between electrical system and, and molecular, we actually use Simulink. Um, other simulators or <laughs> other data processing uh, tools that I used are, bio, uh, are bioinformatic processes. Um, but I want to just take a stand to thank uh, uh, KBase. Uh, so if you look at uh, KBase website, uh, K-B-A-S-E, KBase uh, is a, a, a website where uh, bioinformatics simulator uh, are, in, um, are uh, available and they are public domain. And that's how we simulated those biochemical networks uh, that you saw in the first part of my presentation. And they contain already, I don't know how many species, uh, or they contain all the genome and all the annotation, and they contain also uh, some of the models of the biochemical processes that undergo in a cell. So that, that, that is the three things that I wanted to manage, that to okay. introduce. We have many questions. So, uh, Costa Janakis uh, says, excellent talk. Thank uh, you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so his question, he has two questions. But the first one is, do the cells discussed in those papers come from particular model organisms or ant tissues? Given the differences among cell types, how universal is the proposed framework? Good question. <laughs> Yes, yes, very good. So th that's a very good point. So we we started from being simple. And so something that maybe I should have uh, mentioned and remark a little bit better is uh, we, uh, we looked for now at uh, unicellular organisms. So uh, we, we don't look at tissues, uh, but we look at single cells that interact together. Uh, for example, bacteria or yeast. Uh, one of the primary reason is that we had availability of experimenting with them because of iGEM and the wet lab that my collaborators have. But also those are the main models in mathematical biology uh, to apply information theory. Um, and I, but I agree with you that it's a totally different animal actually <laughs> in the real sense of the world, it's a totally different animal to, think about multicellular organisms and the type of communication channels they have. Uh, I looked at those in other projects that I had. For example, I looked at the nervous system, uh, but, uh, but it, that's another story for another time. But yes, okay. those are unicellular organisms. Uh, Costa is also asking, what is the lifespan of the solutions used in the experiments? Are they stable <laughs> enough to test long-term tests? Wow, okay. okay, this goes really to the point. So I was, I, I was hoping to skip that. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, okay, so currently the, the solution that you saw, for example, to build the interface, okay, is, uh, is pretty stable, meaning that we can have, for example, a full day of experiments with the solution. But the device that I showed you, let's say if I, if I can go a little bit, uh, this device, this device here that contains cells, it's a one-time use because the cells here are immobilized and they cannot move and they are working just as hubs. They transduce information. I didn't say much about this device and you can go to our paper or, or this paper actually where they describe the device. This doesn't include me because it's when they build the device. Um, and so these cells die after some hours. So, so that's a problem of these devices. They are one-time use, like the COVID test. Okay. So uh, there is another one, Toxin Akalin. Excellent talk. I remember this guy, but I don't know from where. So uh, is there an equivalent channel limit in biological channels? Uh, you should refer him to our transaction information theory. But, you know, not really. Uh, and it is better okay. to have a healthy capacity interval for living entities. I hope you have a slide on, the, on that paper that we had. Uh, no. <laughs> or grab but, it. Or... But I, okay, so, so um, we have, okay, I can grab it. It will be just one second. That was a long, 
uh, process to produce yeah. it. You know, people go to toilet and then in two weeks they write papers. And that <laughs> took us one and a half years or maybe longer. Remember in Barcelona, uh, we started it. And I cannot uh, click on it. 13, 2013. Yeah, yeah. But transactional information theory. I wish yeah, I could yeah. grab it right away. No, no, I'm just What's trying your... to find No, no, I, I, I'm on my website uh, with channel memory and molecular noise transactional information theory. Here it is. I'm just sharing my screen one second. Here it is. Okay, so this was a page. Yeah, this was a, this was a, uh, uh, what do you say, a uh, really hard uh, birth. <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, beating, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had, we, uh, well, we have, a, we, we might have a lot of anecdotes on, on this, but uh, uh, so the, in this paper, let me show you a better picture. So this, so in this paper, what we, what we did is actually uh, look at the, the diffusion channel alone. And so if I squeeze the transmitter and the receiver to the simplest, simplest thing possible that I can think of. So the transmitter is emitting is a hole that emits molecules and the receiver is just, a, is just a, a balloon that is permeable to the molecules that is able to count the molecules that get inside. So the diffusion process is just to a minimum. So what we did is we, we took, uh, we, we, this is the only case that I could find in molecular communication where I could build an analytical solution to the Shannon capacity. And so what we found is, uh, oh my God. Okay, what we found is, um, is that we, we have to take into account different processes, the fixed diffusion and the particle location displacement. The fixed diffusion is the model of diffusion, uh, macroscopic, and the particle location displacement is practically the, uh, the, the stochasticity in the location of the particles given, uh, given the distribution that the fixed diffusion uh, imposed to the particle at a specific time instant. So it's practically that the molecule diffuse, but we don't know exactly where they are located. That's a stochastic process. And so if you take into account these two processes and you go on and you kind of work it out and, and you also relate, uh, of course, statistical mechanics entropy, which is the thermodynamic entropy to the Shannon entropy, which is the amount of information, you can actually get uh, using some a couple of theorem uh, a big expression, which is uh, oh my god, this one. This was the the last capacity, and then we had to, of course, find the the maximum of the mutual information in terms of uh, uh, input distribution, and then we found this inform this expression. This information, this expression is dependent on many important parameters. The temperature of the system, uh, then the bandwidth of the system. So the, the bandwidth at which I vary the concentration that I want to transmit. And, uh, and then uh, the enthalpy power, which has the function of the power constraint in Shannon theory, but the origin is a little bit different. So the expression is really not the same. And so this was only confined to diffusion. Once we moved away to diffusion, uh, and that's part in part of the things that I presented today in part of the result, uh, you cannot solve it analytically. And trust me, I tried. Um, it just doesn't simplify. Uh, the, 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 the nested uh, Poisson processes are actually unsolvable. Uh, what you can do is, try to devise a methodology to find bounds, right? And so that's what we do when the channel is intractable in communication theory too. Problem is even to find the bounds, uh, it's not exactly simple. And you've seen that we have that uh, numerical method that is a kind of uh, uh, optimization method that goes to find the bound, but still we are, so we are sure that, that the bound should be below the upper bound, but we haven't yet found the upper bound of the system, of a molecular system, biochemical system with biochemical reactions. And so that's actually the work that we are continuing with, with my student. 
Uh, thank you thank for the question. You, and uh, there is one more from the same, I assume it's a lady, Lokendra. I have no idea where she's located. Uh, first of all, she says, excellent thought, and thank you for your precise information. Uh, you are the God. No, I added that one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, can the molecular communication can really be interfaced with the very high frequency devices? I mean, she says very high frequency and says around gigahertz, but normally when you say very high frequency, you talk about terahertz, but you know, so she says yeah. about uh, around gigahertz. So, okay, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting question. So all the processes that you've seen so far, including our interface, they are at fraction of Hertz, okay? To give you an example. But that doesn't mean that there is no interface at higher frequency. I, uh, I didn't show it today, but it's, when, I, when I teach molecular communication, I, I always show a slide uh, where I took uh, the spectrum, right, of communication. Uh, I take the spectrum and I say, okay, here's the radio spectrum, uh, which is wave. Uh, here is the light spectrum, right? Higher frequency, which is, which is light. Uh, and, it's, and it's both wave and particle photon at the same time. And here is the communication, it's the molecular communication spectrum, which is only matter, so particles. But I, with that, I ignore something that I found out and, and that's one of my research direction right now. I haven't presented here because it's very new. It's that new, new, like of this year. I started studying uh, radiation. I started studying ionizing radiation. Why? Because ionizing radiation, which is extremely high frequency and extremely wide band, okay? And we are talking about radiation that is over the gigahertz, okay? That radiation that is not studied in communication for obvious perspective because it's harmful to biology. In low quantity is actually used at the, the lower side of the spectrum is used in radiotherapy. What does radiotherapy do? It interacts with our tissues, right? And so that, that communication, so high frequency and high bandwidth has the potential to interact with biology and it does we always perceive it as something negative because it breaks usually molecules, it, it creates free radicals, it breaks DNA, creates mutation. But if we could channel that power into something that is safe, and indeed it is already done in radiotherapy, if we could channel that power, we have a huge bandwidth that we can write directly in the biological substrate. And that, that is one of the possible interfaces I'm moving to right now for devices. So ionizing radiation. Don't say too much, you know, people are just like a hungry wolves waiting for something, you know. So <laughs> unfortunately- there, There's a lot to there. study. Uh, cutthroat generation, really. <laughs> uh, I have a, a couple of questions. One is, you had one slide about, you didn't have the yeah. slide uh, pages. You show this von Mises distributions. You yes. only show the two cells, remember? And uh, usually- Yes, here. Yeah. Here. So usually uh, there are uh, a lot of dependencies between the cells, right? So when you have larger number Correct. of cells, uh, how much are they affecting each other? And are the results still valid? That's- uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's very, very, very good. So. Yes, uh, it's true that uh, that cells can affect each other. They can even communicate, but they can also just the the minimum the the simplest way they can affect each other is that they 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 take nutrients from each other, right? And so that's uh, an effect that we consider here secondary, which means that to make the simulation true to reality, we should indeed consider them. But for now, the, in this toy model. We just wanted to limit ourselves to study what happens to cells when they don't interact with each other. And so we eliminated that interaction. But I agree with you. For example, one of the assumptions that I didn't really uh, get out is that we assume that although the concentrations are different at different uh, points of the, of the distribution, here I have uh, a, um, unlimited source of food. 
uh, which is not the case in nature. And so interactions of that type can also work when we look at evolution in a way to shape the channels. And so I agree that the information channels are also shaped by those interaction and they have to be taken into account. But we didn't so far. Yeah, uh, I want to say a couple of things and then I have a, a, a remark or a question again and I think we should uh, conclude the session. Uh, this is mostly for the younger people and uh, Massimiliano is a very good example that, uh, or an eyewitness that what we went through when we started this research like almost 14 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, there were a lot of people, uh, they were attacking us like it's a science fiction. And uh, he was also in some of the conferences how some people were uh, attacking for some nasty comments about the uh, area. And we believed in ourselves, right? So we continued and, uh, you know, now, as Massimiliano mentioned, uh, there are so many people, thanks God, right? Uh, they are working on this. And uh, this is fantastic to see how this area developed, especially from the telecommunications perspective. And now what I observe is, uh, uh, I exclude Massimiliano because it's very impressive, as you can see from his presentation. That's why I also invited him that many people, uh, what I observe is they're doing epsilons, meaning add on work. You know, some of them don't even know what the hell is going on. It's just mathematical formulations. I do this, I do that. Here's a transactions paper. But, you know, it's really time now to show the value of these theories. So in the paper that we wrote in 2019 in IEEE Proceedings from Theory to uh, Applications, uh, Masumana mentioned that we try to somehow uh, uh, put the uh, uh, you know path uh, the the path to that direction. However, it's not that easy. That's why people take it easy out and you know keep writing these theoretical papers. So now my question here is, uh, Masumana, you mentioned here and there, but for the newcomers or you know for external people, it yeah exactly this paper. So uh, it would be good to like tell us. Uh, like as an example, a lot of people think about these uh, COVID now, right? There's all these viruses, like we did bacterial communication. And in fact, you know, they use this type of uh, models, you know, this RNA, you know, the cells and, you know, that's, that would be interesting to, you know, mention that, uh, uh, just to repeat, you mentioned that I know, but maybe it will be good for the audience to just uh, appreciate that. Uh, kind of like the semantic, right? Semantics, not the semantic you mentioned, but you know, why do we need this, right? Uh, all of these theory, and then we'll close the session. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, so why why do we want to apply molecular communication, or let's say information and communication theory, to these kind of systems? Is uh, is because we have the tools and the capability to understand information flow in these systems. And as you can see, information flow is guiding uh, many, many processes and it's actually guiding life itself. Uh, just to cite, um, um, I, uh, I'm always quite close to the NSF program directors in, uh, in MCB, Molecular and Cellular Biology. They are always setting, we're always trying to get proposal to, uh, um, talking about rules of life, right? And they say, what is the rule of life? Because biology is so scattered. Uh, there are biologists that work on systems, biology work on, and so, and, and wh when they asked me, and we had several different town halls and meetings and the workshop, I always say, well, for me, the rules of life, the rule of life is information. Uh, information is everywhere at different scales and drives processes, drives evolution, drives existence. As I demonstrated, maybe we have to rephrase it better, but it's still information. And so what's the importance of studying information in this system is that I can understand better the evolution of this system. I don't have just description, like for example, in medicine, they don't use models, right? They, they mainly they use description. Oh, this works like that, or they are closed models. Uh, this works like that and the medical, the, the medic, the, 
medical doctor makes the diagnosis, right? Uh, but can we have instead working models where I can input, for example, the parameters of a patient uh, in terms of information about the patient? And I can have a model that propagates it uh, uh, virtually in a, in, a, in a sort of dual uh, human body and then pinpoint where the problems might be a priori. And so in other words, information is a lens to read to see these processes and the communication theory is a lens to see these processes, but, but, but it is also a homogeneous lens. Information has always the same uh, metric of measures. And so that's why it's universal. And also uh, when we learn how to engineer information processes and synthetic biology is a perfect tool to do that. We actually learn how to adjust this channel do we want to, do we have a channel that is not working, cancer? Do we want to fix it? Well, maybe I just don't need radiotherapy to kill all the cells that are cancers. Maybe I can have a virus that goes inside and reprograms the cancer cells and reverts them back to not proliferating, for example. And so the origin of those problems are I believe are communication related. And that's how we will make a great impact in humanity and in our society in the years to come. Uh, we started something big and I believe firmly that it become bigger and bigger as our devices will move from being in electronics to being more and more embedded with biology. Just look at the 6G standardization, how it is going. Biology is all there. Thank you, Massimiliano. Uh, I really thank you for everything. And now I'm closing this session and uh, I uh, give the uh, microphone or the podium or whatever you call it now to Alessia. Uh, so I was to sleep. I said, oh, Alessia. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Please stay with us, so stay online. Actually, yes. your last comment introduced yes. us to the Wisdom Corner. Yes, Alessia. You have mentioned well, already some experience and yes. you have shared some lessons. So uh, thank you and stay, stay with us. So thank you very much for your excellent talk, Professor Pierrebon. And now we are ready to start the Wisdom Corner, Live Life Lessons, which is based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle to this series of webinar. We want to add the personal touch. And so successful researchers like Professor Pierrebon today will guide students and young scholars in the field of current ICT research, and will also share some impactful life lessons we know that life is always a journey of discovery and learning. And we also know that success is not because we, we never give up, but it, it's because we never fail. So I would like to address my first question to uh, Professor Pirobon. Uh, so which is your hard earned life lessons or failure that you would like to share with us today that might help somebody attending the webinar? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I'll go very personal now. <laughs> so um, when uh, uh, Professor Achildes actually mentioned when we met in, uh, in uh, Milan and, uh, and uh, a lot of memories came to my mind and just inundated me. And then uh, one feeling came to my mind that was at that time when I was in Milan and I was a bit lost uh, on my, I was actually studying, I studied a PhD there first, and I was a little bit lost uh, with, with, I was doing a different research, but the real problem was not the research topic, it was just, I was right, I was not believing in myself. And so I, I could do great things, but somehow I was saying, no, I'm not worthy or whatever I do, it has already been done maybe. So I was ready to give up. I was really ready to give up. Then I met somebody with a lot of energy and enthusiasm and new topics. And I, and I, and I managed to see like many of my colleagues in Georgia Tech who were working with him, I managed to see beyond that. And, and, and that was the realization that I had a turning point there. So 
should I stay in Milan and, you know, just uh, have my normal life and have a mediocre um, research output? Or I can, or can I put my capabilities, can I, can I overcharge my capabilities or express myself? And so that's the best gift that life can give you after health is, uh, and kids, um, and a good family. Uh, but the other, the other good gift that life can give you is to be able to express yourself at the full potential. Uh, so uh, we had many, many uh, discussion with Professor Achilles actually too about what it means to be successful. And so for example, uh, take a musician. So the musician is successful because it expresses herself or himself to the instrument, right? And a good musician is whoever can transmit that success and that enthusiasm to the audience. Uh, I've been very recently in, a, a <laughs> this is a funny story, but I, I am in a, a PhD committee uh, of, a, of, a, a P, of a PhD student in the music department. Okay. Oh my God, how did I go there? So it's, it's really, different. it's really, uh, it's a long story, but in short, I was at his recital. It's a part of the PhD exams that I have in the departmental department of music. He's a, he's a, a violinist. And when I, when I look at him there in the stage expressing himself, he was achieving his full potential. And he was, it was beautiful. And it gives a lot of power. The same power that I perceive when I saw Achilles giving a presentation of Polymy in Milan, the same power is like, oh, this is a person who's achieved the full potential. I want to do that too. I want to, I want to feel like that. And so that's how everything started. That's how, how, I, want, how I pushed to go to Georgia Tech and, uh, and that's what, what, what and, and everything, everything is something that happened because of that. Um, and so, so that is a hard, uh, you know, learn experience because in a period that in Milan, I was actually suffering inside myself saying, well, okay, I'm producing this little paper and yeah, it's like an incremental result and whatever, I go to the conference, I enjoy the city. I don't know, like things that, no, I, I wanted to do more. And so I jumped up and I said, no, I take, I take ownership of my life. I leave my family, I'm an only child. So it was very difficult to leave my family. Professor Kildis knows very well. Uh, and, but at the same time, I just, I just took ownership of my life and I say, I do it. I just jump to the other side and, and I'm glad I did. So that's a hard, uh, um, um, hard learned life lesson for me. Great, uh, thank you so much for being, for being personal, uh, for sharing this story, very inspiring. Uh, my second question would be, which strengths and capabilities uh, students, uh, young scholars, researchers should be most focused on developing and, uh, and okay. how should they plan to accomplish in this? Okay, um, first, uh, first being open. So many times we study a lot of very nice subjects and we study communication networks and we study numerical analysis, whatever is your, your major. But then, um, and then we are kind of anchored and, and think that discipline are actually closed. And so, and so if you think, okay, wh what do I want to work on? Well, I like programming. Okay, then I do programming. But that's not the way it should be more and more we have to think big. And we have to think that when we have a degree, we just know one tiny part of the full picture. So how do we know the full picture? Well, we can have multiple degrees. That's not feasible, right? Because, uh, well, for example, just an anecdote, uh, Tsubin Mehta, the very, very uh, famous um, uh, orchestra director, Right, Tsubin Mehta. So what happens to Tsubin Mehta? Uh, he was a very critically acclaimed, worldwide famous uh, 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 orchestra director, but uh, he wanted to do more. So he started to be, a, uh, he studied, he wanted to study to be a medical doctor, something completely different. He was interested and curious, which is great. Prize that 
he's, he's put his body to so much stress. So he died of a stroke. Pretty, I mean, he was pretty young still with a lot of success in front of him. So I, I'm not saying I don't want to go dark now, but uh, I, <laughs> this is becoming very personal. But what I want to say is um, it is um, very important to understand that, yes, you have a degree and that's your specialty, but learning doesn't stop there. So when I started studying biology, I was, I mean, I have zero biology, my high school biology. And I was here assistant prof uh, before in Georgia Tech a little bit and then mainly here. And I just asked around for books. And then I started looking at the book and my students were feeling very stressed <laughs> because they were not um, working on a subject that they knew very well, but we were studying together. And that's a beautiful uh, path. So, so my main life lesson here is enjoy the journey. Enjoy studying, reading, and writing. Uh, Professor Kinsey's mentioned I'm not a prolific paper writer, and that's a drawback of that approach, right? Because I like a lot to study. And when I write a paper is when I'm really sure that I'm, I've done my duty to study a subject and I can make an impact in an, in, even in that discipline that I studied, right? That's hard. Uh, it was hard to study electrochemistry, for example. And that happened in the couple, two, couple, couple of, last couple of years. But I went back to the book, I went back to the drawing board and I restudied everything. And, I, and then I, I put together all the knowledge that I acquire and then I started doing creative. So creativity doesn't come by itself, but it has to be inspired. And the best way to inspire creativity is study. And the other thing that I wanna say, talking to people. So uh, we are social entities. Uh, and as Italian, I might be particularly social, but uh, I found very useful throughout the, all these years, talking to people. For example, my proposal got rejected. I just took the plane that was before the pandemic, just took the plane, went to DC, went to the desk of the program director who rejected my proposal and say, why? And so we had two hours conversation. And then she said, I appreciate your research. Uh, it's just maybe the call was not good. It was not uh, the best for your research. Try this. As a matter of fact, after a couple of months, I resubmitted it to another program and it got in to the program that, that, that she was suggesting. That's because I, I reached out. I had a good idea some, some three, four years ago that, that became my project actually. And I wanted to test it out. I call friends in Boston and I say, can you schedule for me something in MIT? Can I, can I give a lecture to the MIT PhD and faculty? It became reality. So a week later I was in Boston and I gave a lecture and I was testing my idea with experts in synthetic biology, Ron Weiss group and, and, and such. Uh, and that was the beginning of all the work in, in synthetic biology that I did later. Um, so so uh, it's good to keep the ideas for yourself, but it's also good to try them out. And so it's a balance, okay, of course. But I was trying them out with people who were not from my field, right? They were from a different field, synthetic biology. And so not, and try to be extrovert and get out your ideas without worry. Alessia, I think you're muted. Sorry, can yes. you hear me now? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for sharing this advice, which I, uh, well, I share too. <laughs> Um, my next question would be, uh, in which field, let's go to the, the, the technical details, in which fields and which topics would you recommend students to study today? Okay. Uh, you, I think you are expecting me to say AI machine learning, right? I'm not expecting anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Please, no, just yeah, kidding. Share your uh, own idea. So, so uh, I want to be a little bit less uh, 
uh, trendy. Uh, and I tell you this, I did what I did, not because I studied fancy topics, but because I knew the basis. Uh, and so uh, start with the basis, understand physics, chemistry, and if you can also study biology, just go for it. Uh, which doesn't mean multiple degrees, but again, for example, if you're if you're if you're if you're an undergrad in US or a grad student in US, it's pretty simple to build an interdisciplinary uh, program of study. Some of my students are doing that, and I, I send them around, right? Uh, and uh, and so try to uh, try to build to be interdisciplinary, but study the basis. For example, you're a PhD student stemming in this field, and you feel that you don't have any chemistry background go take a chemistry course. Don't be afraid to do that. Uh, you have something more than your peers. Even if you go out and look for a job, you will be different than others. And so go to the basis and then think about the details later on. Uh, it's not worthy to study. Um, uh, super trendy subject just to know how things can be set up to have a machine learning uh, algorithm going on and extracting data for you. It's actually better to study the math behind that and then understand why the machine learning works. That's, you can do that later. Yeah, it's great. Uh, actually, this is the advice that the other speakers that we had at the webinars gave us. So start with oh, okay. fundamentals. Yeah, fundamentals. Fundamentals, basics are really, really extremely important. Professor Akidis told me we can do what we do together because we have the basis. And, and part of the reason is in Milan, uh, I actually attended the whole system, the old system of degree where we had full two, three years, all chemistry, uh, all math, uh, physics, uh, from thermodynamics to uh, ele electromagnetics. To, and so there were just two years where I was not thinking about telecommunication or computers. We were doing exam pen and paper and I had books. Mm -hmm. So I was just without devices, without distraction. Well, at that time the devices were a little bit different, but. Um, but that was actually so important. And I realized that later, I was kind of a bit complaining at that time. Oh, we have to study all this. And then I go and work on something that uh, I don't need all this knowledge to do that. But instead, I, I did. I didn't. I, I, I used everything I studied later on. Great. OK, I have another question. Uh, please tell us one of the most uh, tangible contributions that you have made in your career that had a direct or indirect impact on your professional or even, or even on your personal life uh, that you're most uh, proud of. OK, um, I will start from what Achilles was telling us, uh, that is um, the, the, the fundamental goal of being successful in research and uh, you know transforming society through research and research results at the end at the end of the day is the people you have around and the people you form the people you work with and so i would say that one of my best contributions so far is uh, to um, work with students is working with students and and uh, and helping them grow, and so students, as for Achilles, uh, uh, when it was my turn, uh, they were kids for me, and the, and I consider them my kids, and I and I just uh, spend as much time as I can, uh, and we study together. We just uh, I I have I I really get my hands very dirty with them. Um, but that pays off because afterwards you see them successful around and even like in the media, you see them producing papers, you see them happy and you see them that they are starting to be realized even just here, just at the beginning. And so I think that um, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't like the pay of the university professor and you don't like the benefits and you think a company is much better, 
Uh, elsewhere, you do not have this feeling, which is unique. So that is, you are continuously building a family. It's like a, it's like a family factory. <laughs> it's continuous building a family. And, and that's one of the, and I couldn't really understand that when, when Professor Kiddis was telling me when I was his student, uh, but when, when it came my turn, I really got this. And that's what keeps me here. That's what keeps me coming to my office every day and teach and do research is because of the people, is because of the young people I have around. Uh, and so, so that's, that's really the, the, the best gift of this profession, apart from the time flexibility, which is great when you have kids. Uh, but the other, <laughs> the bigger gift is really being able to work with young people and let them grow. Wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot. And I have my last question. Is there yeah. a, a motto, an aphorism, a book, a movie, a piece of art or music that describes you best or your professional path that you simply want to share with us before we close this webinar? Okay, so two things, one motto and one movie. Okay, so the motto is um, uh, information is a difference that makes a difference, which is from Gregory Bateson, uh, who is one of the fathers of cybernetics as we know it today. Um, and it's a motto that I have in my first slide uh, of my information theory course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what, what it means is that um, every time you have, a, you have something that has a variation in the reality around us, it automatically becomes information if I can perceive it. It's information per se, and if I can perceive it, it's information that flows through me or in me. And so my motto is that uh, when, when you make a difference, you are actually generating information in the community. And so even if you look at the bigger picture, when, when you make a difference and you make something that is different, is when you generate impact, is when you generate information and you're ju just not another epsilon different from another algorithm, but you're generating something different, you're generating information, which means that you are helping the scientific community. Movie, totally different. A movie that most of people ignored uh, from years ago. Um, that for me, it was uh, it it last it it had a lifelong long impact. It is Patch Adams uh, with uh, uh, with Robin Williams, and so many says that is the worst movie of Robin Williams. Whatever, uh, Patch Adams himself didn't like it. Seems like, but in any case. Um, um, why is because it's the story of a person uh, who thought everything was lost in his life and he didn't have a purpose. And he was, uh, he was practically crazy, getting crazy, not having a purpose while, being, while having these underneath capabilities. And he was closing this loop. Well, as a matter of fact, he came out and he built uh, uh, an amazing way of doing medicine, uh, disrupting the school where he was in and disrupting society and the way hospitals were working. And so his impact now is everywhere, even if we don't know it, actually his impact in the healthcare is everywhere. And so that movie and that story, life story of somebody who said, oh, I don't have any purpose in life. I lost everything. And then suddenly, suddenly uh, realizes, no, I want to be a medical doctor. I want to help people, but I want to get people smile. I want to have less suffering. And so for me, that, that is a movie that impacted my life and impacted my interpersonal relationship a lot. Wow, yeah, I agree. I watched it and I enjoyed it a lot. 
Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being for for going deep and sharing so much personal about yourself. Thank you. I, I've learned a lot, and I really, really appreciate it. I'm sure that all attendees uh, enjoyed it. Um, so, Ian, I let you close the, this webinar before we. Um, I invite you to join our next one on the 11th of May with uh, Dr. Misha Dollar, uh, who will speak about six G and uh, the metaverse at the same time. So Ian, the floor is yours. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Piero Bonna. Thank you, Alessia. Thank you. And, uh, again, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Massimo. Uh, I would like to uh, point out something, and I hope still people are around. Uh, after listening to Massimiliano, I want to share another view of my life, uh, of my career. Uh, it is about... Uh, uh, advisors and the students. Uh, people who know me, I always try to find connections to other parts of life. For example, in music industry or Hollywood, actually, I want to be in entertainment business, but I became a researcher. Uh, so our, our football, for example, same thing. I was playing football in the 60s. That's why I have this connection to Italy. I love Italian soccer in those years. So the point I try to make is the following. Uh, so if you take a look at the soccer, right, football. So if a trainer is super and the team players, the football players are top, then you have top results. Right? And when you look at all the successful teams, uh, that's the reality. And same thing in the like, conductor must be perfect, top, the, the uh, players must be top, then you have a top result, right? So the point is, you can be a top advisor, but if the students around you are not on your level, you will produce results, but they will not be top, right? Or vice versa. You can be a top student, really very intelligent. The Massimiliano just keeps saying it. And then, you know, your advisor is not interested or he's not into the subject or whatever. And then the students struggle and they cannot produce top results. You know, we have a lot of those cases. So the point is that if there is a match, right, the top advisor and top student, then you produce excellent results. And I'm, I'm really happy, as I mentioned before, uh, one of the best gifts of my life is having all these incredible top-notch people around me and they could somehow, uh, realize my vision and my objectives and uh, the results are out there, right? So thank you again, Massimiliano. And thank uh, you, before my I, pleasure. Yes, before I leave, uh, I would like to encourage also the audience and whoever will watch us uh, on uh, YouTube, please submit your papers to our journal. Uh, we just started in August, 2020, and it takes some time to build up for the ISI status. But I went through that uh, you know, the last 20 years with four journals, with another, uh, actually that was a private uh, uh, entity, not like ITU, ITU is a United Nations entity and, and, and like nonprofit plus, uh, you know, it's an umbrella organization. So uh, it's a very prestigious uh, uh, organization. And I hope through uh, that uh, attraction, we can get more papers and hopefully, uh, uh, reach the ISI status, that will be one of my hopefully uh, uh, last uh, achievements, hopefully, before I leave this world. So uh, thank you. I'm healthy. I'm still healthy. So don't say, oh, he is leaving us. <laughs> no, no, no. There's still a lot of time. We can do yeah, much I mean, more than that. <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you again. Thank and you so I, much I for your pills of wisdom, uh, Ian. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank and thank you, you really. again to the speaker. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, so Bye -bye. Thank you Bye -bye. everybody. Bye -bye. Nice. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye. You too. Bye.